In France, on the other hand, the divine right of kings continued with greater pomp and splendor than ever before, and the ambition of the ruler was only tempered by the newly invented law of the balance of power. As a contrast to the previous chapter, let me tell you what happened in France during the years when the English people were fighting for their liberty. The happy combination of the right man in the right country at the right moment is very rare in history. Louis the Fourteenth was a realization of this ideal, as far as France was concerned, but the rest of Europe would have been happier without him. The country over which the young king was called to rule was the most populous and the most brilliant nation of that day. Louis came to the throne when Mazarin and Richelieu, the two great cardinals, had just hammered the ancient French kingdom into the most strongly centralized state of the 17th century. He was himself a man of extraordinary ability. We, the people of the 20th century, are still surrounded by the memories of the glorious age of the Sun King. Our social life is based upon the perfection of manners and the elegance of expression attained at the court of Louis. In international and diplomatic relations, French is still the official language of diplomacy and international gatherings because two centuries ago it reached a polished elegance and a purity of expression which no other tongue had as yet been able to equal. The theater of King Louis still teaches us lessons which we are only too slow in learning. During his reign, the French Academy, an invention of Richelieu, came to occupy a position in the world of letters which other countries have flattered by their imitation. We might continue this list for many pages. It is no matter of mere chance that our modern bill of fare is printed in French. The very difficult art of decent cooking, one of the highest expressions of civilization, was first practiced for the benefit of the great monarch. The age of Louis the Fourteenth was a time of splendor and grace, which can still teach us a lot. Unfortunately, this brilliant picture has another side which was far less encouraging. Glory abroad too often means misery at home, and France was no exception to this rule. Louis the Fourteenth succeeded his father in the year 1643. He died in the year 1715. That means that the government of France was in the hands of one single man for 72 years, almost two whole generations. It will be well to get a firm grasp of this idea, one single man. Louis was the first of a long list of monarchs who in many countries established that particular form of highly efficient autocracy which we call enlightened despotism. He did not like kings who merely played at being rulers and turned official affairs into a pleasant picnic. The kings of that enlightened age worked harder than any of their subjects. They got up earlier and went to bed later than anybody else and felt their divine responsibility quite as strongly as their divine right, which allowed them to rule without consulting their subjects. Of course, the king could not attend to everything in person. He was obliged to surround himself with a few helpers and counselors, one or two generals, some experts upon foreign politics, a few clever financiers, and economists would do for this purpose. But these dignitaries could act only through their sovereign, they had no individual existence. To the mass of people, the sovereign actually represented in his own sacred person the government of their country. The glory of the common fatherland became the glory of a single dynasty. It meant the exact opposite of our own American ideal. France was ruled of and by and for the House of Bourbon. The disadvantages of such a system are clear. The king grew to be everything. Everybody else grew to be nothing at all. The old and useful nobility was gradually forced to give up its former shares in the government of the provinces. A little royal bureaucrat, his fingers splashed with ink, sitting behind the greenish windows of a government building in faraway Paris, now performed the task which a hundred years before had been the duty of the feudal lord. The feudal lord, deprived of all work, moved to Paris to amuse himself as best as he could at court. Soon his estates began to suffer from that very dangerous economic sickness known as absentee landlordism. Within a single generation, the industrious and useful feudal administrators had become the well-mannered but quite useless loafers of the court of Versailles. Louis was ten years old when the Peace of Westphalia was concluded, and the House of Habsburg, as a result of the Thirty Years' War, lost its predominant position in Europe. It was inevitable that a man with his ambition should use so favorable a moment to gain for his own dynasty the honors which had formerly been held by the Habsburgs. 
In the year 1660, Louis had married Maria Theresa, daughter of the King of Spain. Soon afterward, his father-in-law, Philip IV, one of the half-witted Spanish Habsburgs, died. At once, Louis claimed the Spanish Netherlands, Belgium, as part of his wife's dowry. Such an acquisition would have been disastrous to the peace of Europe and would have threatened the safety of the Protestant states. Under the leadership of Jan de Witt, Rod Pensionaris, or Foreign Minister of the United Seven Netherlands, the first great international alliance, the Triple Alliance of Sweden, England, and Holland of the year 1664 was concluded. It did not last long. With money and fair promises, Louis bought up both King Charles and the Swedish estates. Holland was betrayed by her allies and was left to her own fate. In the year 1672, the French invaded the Low Countries. They marched to the heart of the country. For a second time the dikes were opened and the royal sun of France set amidst the mud of the Dutch marshes. The Peace of Nimwegen, which was concluded in 1678, settled nothing but merely anticipated another war. Here you see a picture of scales with France and Spain on one side and England and Holland on the other and they're at balance. And it is titled The Balance of Power. A second war of aggression from 1689 to 1697, ending with the Peace of Ryswick, also failed to give Louis that position in the affairs of Europe to which he aspired. His old enemy, Jan de Witt, had been murdered by the Dutch rabble, but his successor, William III, whom you met in the last chapter, had checkmated all efforts of Louis to make France the ruler of Europe. The Great War for the Spanish Succession, begun in the year 1701, immediately after the death of Charles II, the last of the Spanish Habsburgs, and ended in 1713 by the Peace of Utrecht, remained equally undecided, but it had ruined the treasury of Louis. On land, the French king had been victorious, but the navies of England and Holland had spoiled all hope for an ultimate French victory. Besides, the long struggle had given birth to a new and fundamental principle of international politics, which thereafter made it impossible for one single nation to rule the whole of Europe or the whole of the world for any length of time. That was the so-called balance of power. It was not a written law, but for three centuries it has been obeyed as closely as our laws of nature. The people who originated the idea maintained that Europe, in its nationalistic stage of development, could only survive when there should be an absolute balance of the many conflicting interests of the entire continent. No single power or single dynasty must ever be allowed to dominate the others. During the Thirty Years' War, the Habsburgs had been the victims of the application of this law. They, however, had been unconscious victims. The issues during that struggle were so clouded in a haze of religious strife that we do not get a very clear view of the main tendencies of that great conflict. But from that time on, we begin to see how cold economic considerations and calculations prevail in all matters of international importance. We discover the development of a new type of statesman, the statesman with the personal feelings of the slide rule and the cash register. Jan de Witt was the first successful exponent of this new school of politics. William III was the first great pupil, and Louis XIV, with all his fame and glory, was the first conscious victim. There have been many others since.